Hello, and welcome to the American Floral Endowment's three-part webinar series for Thrips Research. Throughout this series, we will hear the latest findings from AFE's Thrips and Botrytis Research Fund. AFE is the national nonprofit organization that funds scientific research to identify and solve challenges within the floriculture industry. In 2021, AFE is celebrating 60 years of providing for the future of floral. In 2017, after listening to important industry feedback, AFE established a special research fund to aggressively address the control and management of thrips and botrytis. AFE's goal of reaching 1.5 million in pledges was met in 2019 with contributions from 24 industry leaders and organizations to support new and innovative research to address these challenges. With those funds, AFE has been able to support eight multi-year research projects to reduce losses and produce higher quality flowers and plants. The American Floral Endowment and all researchers would like to thank all of the organizations who have made contributions in support of this important initiative. Today's speaker is Dr. J.C. Chong, Professor and Extension Specialist of Turf and Ornamentals Entomology at Clemson University. Thank you everybody for joining us today and good morning, good afternoon and wherever you are. And today we'll be talking about thrips, of course, and I'm going to focus mostly on the uh, uh, Western flower thrips, um, the uh, chemical control. And uh, hopefully uh, some of you attended the, uh, the, the two previous series uh, webinar from this series uh, presented by Dr. Rose. And maybe you remember something that she has talked about, which are the uh, challenges that, that is managing thrips. And of course, thrips is probably, everybody knows, is probably one of our most difficult and most common pests to control in floriculture. And um, to make things worse, of course, they damage the part that we value as our product, which is the flowers. Um, when the flowers are damaged, you know, they're probably not very sellable at all. And in some cases, uh, they are a major uh, issues with um, uh, virus transmission, and that's a huge problem. And because of how cryptic they are and how much problem they have, a lot of country actually have a lot of restrictions as far as um, uh, when, when it comes to thrips and any other invasive species. And thrips are is very much on the radar for a lot of governmental organization, particu particularly customs, into checking whether they are being uh, introduced or not. And they're not easy to do as you think because uh, thrips are so much smaller and uh, very difficult to uh, very difficult to find. And they have live stages that actually hide in very tight places. So uh, it's really not that easy. But today really what I'm gonna focus on again, are insecticide and talk more about the two risks that we are dealing with when it comes to using insecticide for thrips management, mainly uh, the lack of effective insecticide and also a very high tendency for the thrips to develop a resistance. Now, with support from AFE and the soccer forest, uh, I visited Columbia greenhouses uh, in the 2018. Uh, you know, I've seen a lot of things down there that, that's really interesting. And not only do they till all the uh, crop residue into the soil, they also have some sort of a flame throwing car to really burn down the debris and with the hope of killing the thrips and also the debris, uh, also the diseases that are in those debris. And a lot of operations use uh, sticky strips uh, very liberally, basically have strips all over the place uh, with the hope that it would really capture thrips and any other insects that's flying into the greenhouse. And also um, some of the operation actually uh, develop their own pest management too in some way. This is one of the, uh, bug sucking a bug vacuum that they developed uh, in one of the farm where they would suck up thrips and white flies, aphids, just about anything that might come to the uh, uh, chrysanthemum crop. And probably the most amazing things that I've seen in Colombia is the extent and the effort and time that growers put in just to make sure that they have a crop that doesn't really have thrips particularly for crops actually uh, shipped to a lot, uh, shipped to countries that have very strict phytosanitary regulations. And in this particular picture is basically showing 
um, at one of the farm where they are preparing plants, to sh uh, preparing cut flowers to ship to Chile. Chile actually have a pretty tight um, phytosanitary regulations. And so when they found thrips in one of their preliminary survey, they actually have to go through all their crops just to you know shake the thrips out of the out of the crops that they are collecting. So growers in Colombia and growers everywhere are going extraordinary length just to try to control thrips. And something like this, picking every little flowers to make sure you don't have thrips, is not practical in the US, of course, uh, because just the labor cost is going to bankrupt our company. Um, so not every options are available to the growers in the US, but there are very specific common theme that I've seen uh, in Colombia, as well as throughout the US. Um, I am based in South Carolina, but I do consult with a lot of different growers across the country uh, from, you know, uh, to California, to Minnesota, all over the place. Now, one thing that I noticed, particularly in Colombia, in the Southern US, and also in California, is that most of the greenhouses that we have are open-sided so that we can actually take uh, advantage of this natural flow of air, uh, natural ventilation, just to cool things down. So this is one operation in Colombia, as you can see, the side is pretty much open. And this is a typical small production in the South where you have a relatively low tech, high tunnel, uh, but with raised side as well. And even for bigger operations such as Metrolina, on a good day, they even open up the van just to get um, some good airflow. And of course, in California, most of the operations are actually open side or in the field production. So when you actually have production of flowers in the field or open side of the greenhouse, you know, thrips has a way to get in. You need to get ready for it because they can be picked up by wind from any field around and then blown into the greenhouse. And once they get into the greenhouse, they can start a lot of damage onto the flower crops, crops that we want to produce. So what can you do as far as trying to stop the influx of these thrips into the greenhouse or your outdoor nurseries? Um, you know, for greenhouses, of course, you can use, uh, uh, for many decades, uh, we entomologists has been recommending the use of uh, thrips exclusion screens. Basically, you put a fine mesh screen on the vent and also the side just so that the thrips cannot get through. But understand that thrips are very, very small. So the screen size are also very, very small. When you have those small screen size, you're basically impeding the airflow. And inside the greenhouse, you're gonna, gonna have very high humidity, high temperature, and you're gonna have more disease problem. So um, even though um, thrips exclusion screen has been shown to be effective, uh, it may not be practical in all situations. Another option would be to remove all the vegetation around the greenhouse. The idea is that you basically remove all the flowering crops or even other plants so that the thrips are not attracted and they are also not building up a population that they can later spread into the greenhouse or the uh, nursery itself. And But there's another approach to take it the other direction which is actually purposefully growing certain plants on the outside of your greenhouse or on the outside of your nurseries. The idea of those plants are not just to look pretty, they actually serve a very specific function, which is they will attract the thrips. So when they get to those crop on the outside, fewer of them would get into the greenhouse or the nursery. And you can focus in on controlling the thrips from those from the uh, companion uh, border planting. So there will be an option as well. Some of the uh, green, uh, European nurseries and greenhouses are actually doing that uh, with some degree of success, I say. Uh, and also, uh, as you have seen in some of the pictures earlier is that you can always do mass trapping with sticky card. Um, but personally, I do not prefer that particular method because uh, oftentimes I ended up sticking myself to the sticky card or sticky trap. And that's not exactly a pleasant feeling. But of course, uh, with a lot of options that we have available, everybody is using insecticide. And well, a lot of folks are using insecticide and not only do using insecticide, but also using them repeatedly. And that would be the options. Uh, that would be the options that I'll be talking, focusing today. 
And of course, um, there's also the option of using biological control as a preventive too. Basically, the idea is to release a high number of biological control on your crop, using them almost like a standing army. Uh, so that when the thrips come down, there's already a biocontrol agency to control uh, to, to kill it. So to really avoid any kind of damage. So those are some of the options. And it would take me like a whole day just to talk about all this stuff. So uh, just about impossible for all the time that we have today. So if you have any issues or any questions about any of these uh, uh, additional control methods, let me know, send me an email, we can have a chat. So today, what I want to do is really focus on the insecticide itself. Um, the insecticide, um, I'm not, I'm not going to talk about, I'm going to introduce to you some of the insecticides that are available for us and also talk about how effective they are. And this efficacy, efficacy data are not anecdote. It's not because JC said so. No, these are actually efficacy data that are gathered by more than 90 trials done all over the country some of them myself, um, just to look at how effective each one of these insecticides is in controlling thrips, particularly the Western flower thrips. Now, uh, if I'm just talk, going to talk about whether they're effective or not and not telling you how to use them, eh, that's not very effective at all. So part of the time that I'm going to do today is also uh, to give you more uh, suggestion or guidance as far as how you can apply the efficacy data that we are talking about today. Um, so a lot of these trials, 90 something trials are done by different organizations. It could be done by uh, university, uh, using funding from university, or it could be supported by the companies that produce the uh, insecticide, or it could be from you through your trade organization like AFD, uh, just to support um, this kind of uh, work. And a lot of it, is actually done by an organization called IR4. For those of you that are not familiar with IR4, IR4 is a quasi-governmental organization in some way. Basically, the, the goal of IR4 is to collab collaborate with all the researchers throughout the country, particularly those that work with ornamental crops. And the goal is for this uh, group of scientists to actually look at the efficacy to, to try different kinds of insecticide that's not registered in the ornamental plant. Gather the necessary safety and efficacy data so that we can register this new insecticide uh, or pesticide or fungicide or herbicide in the ornamental crops. So what they want to do is to increase our arsenal in controlling uh, our pests. So they have been doing quite a bit of good work. So I want to give them a shout out and you know, you probably wonder how in the world they choose to work on thrips. They don't just work on thrips or, you know, botrytis or, 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 or anthracnose or things like that. And the, the way that the IR4 decide how they are going to go into selecting what pests they want to work with really depends on the input from you. So right now there's a survey going on just to find out what is your biggest pest problem and what, where do you see uh, your best, your your biggest pest management challenges are, and uh, in next year we'll take a look at all that survey data, and then we're going to say, hmm, thrips is still a big problem. Okay, for 2022 and 2023, we're going to continue to work on thrips, do more trials on thrips. So your input is going to determine the direction of IR4 research. By the way, um, so if you want your voice heard, participate in the survey. And the uh, data that I'm going to talk about today is actually freely available to everybody. So if you go to the IR4 website and then you click on the uh, sub, uh, research summary data uh, tab, when you click on that, you know, it's going to bring you all kinds of research summary. For example, for Thrips, there is a new research sum uh, efficacy summary that's published earlier this year, and that thing is 204 pages long. So if you read, need something to read before you go to bed, well, that's a pretty good one to use. But all of that is basically gathering all the research data that IR4 ever done in the past 14 years, put them in that one document so that you have a digested, a, a, a summary of information right there. It's very dense, but you're gonna find a lot of good information in there. And Thrips efficacy summary is not just the first, the only one that you can find. You can also find efficacy for say, pylon or um, 
um, uh, crop 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 uh, safety summaries and fungicide efficacy and things like that. So check it out uh, if you got time and just go to IR4, go to the uh, survey summary tab and you'll find your information right there. So today, let's get to the meat of our uh, discussion today. So um, before I move on to, to, to our presentation, what I want to mention is that I'm going to classify the insecticide a little bit, um, a little bit for you. Um, so I kind of think of insecticide as either uh, systemic insecticide or a contact or translaminar insecticide. And systemic insecticide are basically those insecticides that you can apply either as a drench or granular to the medium and the root will soak it up and then send it to the rest of the canopy. So systemic insecticide uh, actually can go up the plant tissue and spread out. Uh, contact uh, insecticide basically kills the insect by contact. It doesn't go into the plant tissue at all. Translaminal insecticide basically will go into the leaf tissue and stay in the leaf tissue. It doesn't go everywhere else in the, uh, in the plant. So uh, those are the three types of uh, insects that we have. So systemic insecticide, these are the systemic insecticide that are available, uh, uh, registered for use against thrips in greenhouses and nursery in the US, okay? So you have um, the uh, neonicotinoid or 4A product, and then you have a combination product. 4C are basically the uh, expire. Uh, 4D, uh, Altus or Flupyrotifuron, uh, 23, is Acantos 28 are the diamite, uh, mainspring and pradia, and then 28, 29 plus 29 is, uh, is pradia actually. So uh, the systemic insecticide, these are the ones that's available in the US. And these are the systemic insecticide available in Colombia. So what you have is gonna be that you have a lot of neonicotinoids. So neonicotinoids are basically those that are labeled 4A, right? So you have uh, Acetemprid, you got di Dinotepran, you got Crodianotin, you got Imidacoprid, you got Diamidoxin. Those we have in the US too. But in Colombia, there's another one, which I label in green, uh, is not available in the US. But anyway, so when you look at this list from Colombia, what you are gonna notice is that there are a lot of 4A product. Okay, that that is a concern to me because what it means is that in Colombia, for thrips management is relying way too heavily on neonicotinoid. And that have very serious consequences, especially when it comes to pest, uh, when it comes to uh, uh, pesticide resistant development. And thrips is really notorious for their ability to develop insecticide resistance. Uh, right now, currently, based on the uh, database that's maintained, uh, Western flower thrip is uh, has 175 documented cases of resistance to 29 different uh, active ingredients. And some of these ingredients are something that we use pretty frequently. For example, um, acetamiprid in the US is called TriStar. It's resistant to that. It is resistant to spinosad, which is in the US, we call it conserve. And it is resistant to apomactin. And which is uh, which is called Avid uh, in the U.S. So, what you're seeing is that um, thrips has a proven ability to really develop resistance very quickly and to a lot of different kind of insecticides. Now, know that um, most of these uh, resistant cases are reported here, there, not all over the world, but the resistant developing in say China has very serious implication for plant in Colombia. It doesn't mean that the resistance in China is gonna end up in Colombia, no. But it kind of show you how likely it is for the thrips to develop resistance and more important for you to actually think about your resistant development or your resistant management program uh, a little bit more carefully. So the most important thing you can do about uh, delaying the development resistance is to practice IPM. Instead of using insecticide and insecticide only, you also consider some other options. For example, biological control. Uh, for example, instead of spraying pylon 15 times over entire crop season, uh, you probably want to put in a few biopesticide or some other products in there just to break up the, the chain, the train mill that you're gonna end up getting 
and so that you ended up uh, getting a resistant thrips population. And you only use insecticide only when it's necessary. When you don't need it, then use it. I mean, the more you spray, sometimes it's going to cost you even more money. But the easiest thing for you to do uh, to delay the development of pesticide resistance is to rotate insecticide among different modes of action. Um, the modes of action uh, is sort of jargon, but it what it actually means is that how it actually kills the insects. That's mode of action. And IRAC, which is the Insecticide Resistant Action Committee, actually classify all these mode of action and give them each a unique number or a letter, just so that we can actually remember what they are. Now, if you look at uh, a typical list of uh, system insecticide available in Colombia, this is what we have. Uh, you know, when you look at that, I rank number 4A, those are all neonicotinoids. So you don't have, even though within 4A, there are a lot of different active, active, active ingredients, they still belong to the same mode of action. So if you're going to develop a resistant rotation program, you don't want to follow 4A with 4A and 4A. In that way, you're not changing up the mode of action, you're going to eventually develop having resistant development. Okay, so how do you know what mode of action you have for the product that you intend to use? Well, you can read the label, uh, you can read a lot of different literatures, but do understand that, you know, um, usually the mode of action name is pretty long. This is one example that I can give you, which is a Ventigra, uh, which is a product in the US, a new one. Uh, the active in the ingredient is a fetopyrifen, and the mode of action usually showed up on the label is 9D. 9 is the IRAC number, okay? When, when you say 9, what it indicates is that it's one mode of action. D indicates the class. So 9D means that a fetopyrifen is a cocoronal TRPV uh, or cocoronal organ TRPV channel modulators in the chemical class of pyroprene. That's a long name. I mean, I breathe and I eat insecticide resistant management and I still cannot remember that long name. So to make it easy for you to remember, I write develop that letters and, and, and numbers and letter system so that you in the US, they can be put on the label and everybody can pick up the label and say, huh, this is 90. Last week I sprayed 9A, hmm, same numbers. Not a good idea to rotate to this one. Let's go with another one. So it makes the, uh, uh, the, 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 the uh, rotation, development of rotation program a lot easier that way. Okay, so, okay, you know the IRAC number. So how do you put together a rotation program? And it's pretty easy. Uh, I always call it the uh, the um, follow the number game in some way. Basically, the, the rule is the first product and the second product should have a different number. It doesn't matter what letter you have. It should have a different number, okay? Let's look at a few examples. First example is, all right, this week you want to say, you want to spray acetaminophen or Tristol. Next week, you're spraying spinosad. And the week after that, you spray apomectin. Now, this is a good rotation program. Why? Because apomectin is 4A, spinosad is 5, and uh, uh, acetaminophen is 4A, spinosad is 5, and apomectin is 6. So you're looking at rotating from one number to another. That's okay. So let's look at another example. If you have acetaminophen followed by full priority furon, followed by apomectin. So is that a good program? Eh, not so good. Why? Because acetaminophen and full priority furon, even though one of them is 4A, the other one is 4D, they still share the same number four. So you don't want to rotate to another product of the same number. So that is not a good rotation program. Here's another example. Let's just say, the, oh, this week you want to spray Tristar. Next week you want to spray Discus. The week after that you want to spray uh, uh, Expire. Now in this case, I'm not talking about active ingredient, I'm talking about the trade names. So even though you're rotating among different trade names, if you look deeper into it, what you're gonna find out is that Tristar is 3A, Discus is 4A plus 3A, and Expire is 4C plus 5. So what you're gonna end up is 
tau star has um, are in the same mode of action as uh, as discus, and discus is sort of in the same mode of action as expire. So in that case, you shouldn't be rotating them uh, that way. So that's not a very good rotation program at all. So these are basically a very general rules as far as rotating in sex site. So if you need more information about rotating sex site or need help with developing one for your particular operation, send me an email, let me know. Uh, we can talk about it. Okay, right, so we talked about the system insecticide. Now we're going to talk about the uh, insecticide you can spray on the foliage or basically do a foliage spray. Now the foliage spray insecticide could be systemic. Um, for example, on this table, you have uh, 4A. Uh, these are systemic insecticide. You can use them for drench, you can use them for granular application, but you can also spray them. So um, they would include the uh, systemic insecticide or they could be uh, translaminar insecticide or they could be contact insecticide. Okay, so when it comes to insecticide that's registered for foliar spray to control thrips, there are actually quite a few options. Um, you have some, you have some of the uh, systemic insecticide here. So there are quite a few of them, and if you look at systemic insecticide, uh, what you're going to find out is that um, not all of them working about the same way. Uh, so here in this particular table, I'm just going to show you the efficacy of what we are finding in the past few, uh, uh, in the past trials. Um, so what you're seeing is that in the parentheses, you're going to have um, P and E. P means pool. Uh, how is an insecticide classified pool? I classify insecticide having poor efficacy when they reduce less than 50% of the population. What is excellent? Excellent is an insecticide that reduces more than 95% of the population. So that's the difference there. And you can see the classification at the bottom of the slide there. So anyway, so these are the systemic insecticides that you can apply as drench or granular. So when you apply as drench and granular, through many of the trials that we have done, what we are finding out is that when you apply systemic insecticide as drench or granular, they are not that effective in controlling thrips. And that's not just one trial, not just my trial, but a lot of my colleagues' trial too. And the one product that we have seen better efficacy in controlling thrips when it's drenched is uh, uh, cyanotranilipole, or in the US it's called mainspring, okay? So this particular product uh, is the only one that we have seen with more efficacy in, con in controlling thrips when it, comes to con uh, when it comes to drenching. So here are some of the, uh, some of the comparison pictures that I'm going to show you. So on the far left side, what you're going to have are leaves of uh, uh, petunia, oh, actually leaves of uh, verbena uh, that has uh, water check. So on the water check leaves, what you're going to see is a lot of stippling. Those are the damage by the ribs. But if you are drenching them with mainspring or flagship, and what you're going to have is leaves that look pretty clean. There's not a whole lot of stippling. In fact, there are just as few stipplings as the one that you use Conserve for. Conserve has always been one of my go-to products when it comes to controlling the thrips. So what this is showing me is that systemic insects, like when you drench them, you actually get pretty good efficacy, as good as Conserve or spray. What about flowers? Well, what we're seeing is that uh, systemic insects actually do a pretty lousy job in trying to prevent damage on the flowers, All right? So, what you're going to see here throughout this is that when you do a drench with mainspring, and in fact with flagship as well, any kind of systemic insecticide, you are still going to see as, as much stippling on the flower petal as you do in the water check. But if you spray them with the same product like mainspring, you're going to see much fewer um, stippling on the flowers. Why, this, why is that? So the reason for that is because systemic insecticide, when you actually apply to as drench or granular to the root zone, when the roots soak it up, they usually send most of the active ingredients to the leaves, not to the flowers. So on your flowers, there's not a whole lot of residual and you are not getting a uh, very good control of that way. So that's why we're not seeing very good control on the flowers, but good control on the leaves. And this kind of result actually have pretty important implications for how you can use systemic insecticide to control thrips in your operation. 
So systemic insects, like the way I'm thinking about it, the value of them is it will give you a much longer term control if you apply them as a soil drench or granular to protect your flower foliage. So if you have a crop that's actively growing and doesn't have any flowers yet, you could use a systemic insect site, so drench it, and you would protect the leaves. But as soon as your flower is showing up, you probably cannot, you probably should don't, don't want to use systemic insect site, so apply as granular or drench, because from our data, it's showing that it's not very effective in protecting flowers. So if you want to protect the flowers, you have to rely on spraying. Okay, and in fact, could be pre-repeated spray because most of the insects that we have have pretty short residue. Right. So let's look at the uh, insecticide that we have available for foliar spray. These are a bunch of those. Uh, some of them are pretty old, actually. Uh, for example, Mediocarp or Measurol. Uh, this is the uh, trade name in the US. Uh, old stuff, but still, I still consider it as one of the best material for thrips management. The only problem is that it is very highly toxic and it has very long uh, REI or restricted entry interval. Um, so we kind of have to spray and then wait 24 hours before you can get back in, unless you're wearing PPE. That's a very long time for most uh, folks trying to maintain a growing uh, operation. So that's not always the best thing to use, but we're, when it comes to push, come to shove, that might be one option that you have. Um, some of the products, including 3A, 3A is basically the pyrethroid. In my experience, eh, We'll talk about efficacy in a little bit. Uh, you can also spray uh, 4A, which are the neonicotinoid. Like I said earlier, they are systemic, but they are also available for spraying. And then you have 4C, 4D, um, 5, which is spinosad. 6 is uh, apomectin. Uh, spinosad is conserved, apomectin is avid. In my experience, those are still my go-to product when it comes to controlling a uh, grips population. But throughout the country, in fact, throughout the world, resistant reports of resistance uh, has come up uh, quite a bit. So those may be uh, uh, may not be an option for very, very long. Uh, pylon or 13 or clofenopair uh, is one of the very effective product for thrips, uh, spider mite and also caterpillars as well. But the only thing is, it's only registered for greenhouse. Uh, so there are some other products like uh, Tofen Pirate, which is relatively new or Hachi Hachi. In my experience, works pretty well. And then 28 is probably the newest group of product that we have in the marketplace, like Mainspring or Pradia or Cerisa. Um, efficacy is there. And then, of course, you have some other older product like horticulture oil uh, that you can use uh, for thrift management as well. So when it comes to spraying, there are a lot more options. In Colombia, uh, there are also options as well. And again, uh, most of the products are actually dominated by uh, neonicotinoid and also a little bit with organophosphate. There's some pyrethroid there as well, uh, but most of it are neonicotinoid. So, um, and continue. And what you're seeing is that in Colombia, actually the available uh, active ingredients are not as wide as the US, um, but uh, most of the product that they have, we have in the US, they have most of those as well. Um, let's see, but, 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 uh, one thing I would need to mention about Colombia operation is that many of the operation actually use magnesium phosphine uh, as a fumigant for cuttings ready to go into the operation, domestic operation, or um, flowers uh, for export. Uh, basically use a, a fumigant to try to kill the thrips in there. Uh, there are some options there. So how effective are they? Uh, what we're seeing is that uh, spray application typically is more, a little bit more effective than uh, drench operation uh, applications if you are talking about systemic insecticide. For example, uh, group 4A or the neonicotinoid. Uh, remember that when we are talking about drenching, most of them is like poor, 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 poor good, poor. Uh, but when we're talking about fully spray, they got fair uh, efficacy, average fair. Um, so they are a viable options but something that you probably need to mix in, uh, you want to partner with it with something else to actually do a very good job with controlling. Um, for, and also some of the products such as um, Spinosad, 
Abermectin, I talk about those. Those are my pro go-to product. They are usually very effective. Cofrinopir, Pylon is very, very good when it comes to controlling thrips. And uh, Hachi Hachi in some of my trial has worked very well against, uh, against uh, thrips as well. And Novaluron 15, which is an insect growth regulators. And some of the uh, IR, IR4 trial is returning as excellent efficacy. But I do need to caution you about that because there's only one um, study done on that, okay? So uh, kind of take that result with a grain of salt in some way. So continue, uh, 23 is Contos, uh, kind of poor. And 28 is uh, Dimite. Uh, one of the best product in there is uh, Mainspring, Mosaintranilopo, got pretty good efficacy. Another product called Cerisa, which is very new, Cyclonilopo, by itself, it only got about fair efficacy. But if you use a similar product, they have a combination with um, uh, phonicamide or aria called Pradia. Pradia actually gives you much better efficacy than Cerisa by itself. So kind of give you options there. Um, so another product I want to mention is uh, Overture. If you are in the greenhouse operation and you have thrips population, I think Overture is a good option as well. In most of our study, it works very well. Um, so. All right, so what is the value of your foliage spray? Um, really, if you're protecting flowers, I think foliage spray might be the only way to go about it. Um, but you need to understand that it has actually a very short residual efficacy. First of all, is that first it has short re residual efficacy. It breaks down relatively quickly. You, and also another thing is any flowers that are closed, when you spray it, when they open up, there's no residual inside. So you're not protecting those newly opened flowers. So it basically um, necessitates you to actually make repeated application, unfortunately. So is repeated application really the best way to go? Uh, can you spray weekly or every other day? You could, but I don't think that's sustainable. Uh, so we really need a lot of other um, options for controlling thrips. And I think biological control is a viable option. Like I say earlier, if you can release biological control action, uh, or agents onto your crop way before the threat showed up, you can actually have a, almost like a standing army approach, just to deal with that. So if you are using biological control agents, I really need to remind you to really think about the compatibility of all your pre uh, pesticides when you're practicing biological control. And of course, AFE is uh, Thrip Simple Try This campaign is funding a lot of other research in trying to figure out all the other alternative as far as controlling um, thrips. And this would include, you know, garden plants or cutting dips or uh, silicone applications or UV light or biopesticide and nutrient management. And there may be more coming down the road. So um, progress are being made. Um, for some, some of us probably feel like Progress is very slow, but progress is definitely made. So in the future, uh, I hope I'll be able to talk to you guys again more about you know what other approaches do we have in controlling groups. Additional findings from all of AFE's research can be found online at www.endowment.org. We hope that you enjoyed today's presentation. Research and research findings like those presented today are possible only through industry support and contributions. Thanks to generous donors, AFE can provide research solutions free to support a stronger industry. Consider making a tax-deductible contribution to support the future of the floral industry. Visit endowment.org today and check back often for new sessions and updates.